Well, good Sunday morning to you. Welcome to church, albeit it's online church, right? You're watching this on YouTube. Uh, my name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And I have a question for you, question this morning. Who woke up this morning and said, whoopee, Bible, yes. Anyone? Just me, just me. That's okay, because we have a lot of Bible, a lot. What does that mean? It means there's going to be a lot less of me speaking and a lot more of, let's just crack this book open and let the Bible speak for itself. The Bible can speak for itself. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That means the Bible is perfectly capable of teaching you and speaking to your heart. You don't need me. I'm just a mouthpiece. I'm just an interpreter. Last week I said, what do I know? I'm just some dumb 52 year old. So today there's gonna be like 86% Bible and only 37% me. I told you I was dumb. Uh, last week I said the Holy Spirit is a he. Right? The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a personhood, a will, a mind. The Holy Spirit is sentient. The Holy Spirit is living, capable of equipping us and giving us gifts. But even five sermons now into this series, we're not even scratching the surface of identifying and understanding the Holy Spirit. Now, we said the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. We said the Holy Spirit guides people to truth. The Holy Spirit glorifies God, helps us when we worship. And then when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit affirms that we are in the family. The Holy Spirit breaks down barriers for people who are trying to spread the gospel, and the Holy Spirit directs the believer in their life. Now, is that all? Of course not. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The Bible says you will never fully understand God. That means you can sit in church every single week, never miss a Sunday. You can attend every single Bible study, you can read every single book, and there will still be secret things that you will never understand. Because, spoiler alert, <laughs> you don't come to church to understand God. You don't. You come here to worship God. You don't come here to learn about all the things that you don't know. We come here to worship the parts of God that we do know. And we're learning about the Holy Spirit and because of that, that means we're also learning about Jesus. We're also learning about the Father, which means our study of the Holy Spirit is really, when you think about it, it's really a study of the Trinity. Now, people first started talking about the doctrine of the Trinity in the early third century by the church father Tertullian. Tertullian was a prolific early Christian author from Carthage in the Roman province of Africa. He was the first Christian author to produce an extensive body of work of Latin Christian literature. And among those works, Tertullian explicitly defined the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he defended his theology, although he noted that the majority of believers of his day did not agree with him. We skip later to the Nicene Creed, of 325 that would go on to say, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of light, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, and we believe in the Holy Ghost. One God, three persons just like the song says, right? Blessed Trinity, right? In Trinitarian doctrine, God exists as 
three persons, or a very fancy word, hypostasis. Three persons but one being having a divine nature. The members of the Trinity are co-equal, co-eternal, one in essence, one in nature, one in power, one in action, and one in will. Understand? Of course not. <laughs> He's God, right? And the Bible says that some things are what? A mystery, a secret. You can't fully understand God. And that's okay. Isaiah 40 says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. The Bible says, have you not known? Have you not heard? Of course. Why? Because his understanding is unsearchable. So if we can't understand him, if some things are a mystery, if they're a secret, well, then why bother trying? Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy for our answer. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Why? That we may do all the words of this law. We don't come to church to understand God, but rather to worship the parts of God that we do understand. Deuteronomy says what is revealed to us, in other words, the parts we understand, they exist. Why? So that we may do all the words of the law. In other words, obey. What's important here? What's our takeaway? The most important thing in our lives is not that we continue to try to understand God or to explain God, but to obey God. You know, and I was thinking about this in preparing for this sermon, because in church, we're always taught to grab the bulletin, right? And then we're always taught to fill in the blanks. And it's an old it's an old public speaking trick to help people pay attention. It's a, but it's a terrible lesson to learn while we learn about God. God is not a puzzle. God is not a word search. And the parts that are missing are purposefully left blank. It's not up to, up to us to guess or to fill those things in. It's not our job to understand him especially when my life isn't going the way that I thought. Life did not go the way we thought it would this week. <clears throat> Maybe you're disillusioned right now. Maybe you're disappointed right now. Maybe someone got sick this year or died this year. You had an operation this year. You, you hurt yourself this year. You are weaker this year than previous years. You are more frail this year. You're more broke this year. 2020 wasn't your year. Really? <laughs> Join the club, right? <laughs> but it's not our job to then question the creator of the universe and to ask why, or, or to file a complaint maybe with God's help desk. Job did that. Job was having a bad year. He faced heartache and loss. And then for 37 chapters, Job and his friends, they tried to figure God out. They made their case and they said, either Job, they said, either you're a sinner or God is a jerk. That's what they came up with. Job was either being punished for something that he did or he was being unjustly punished for something he didn't do. And finally, Job uh, at the end of 37 chapters, he shakes his fist to the sky and says, what is it, God? Which one? Answer me. Tell me. Explain yourself to me. Job wanted to understand God's ways, and for 37 chapters, God is silent. But in chapter 38, God answers. The Bible says the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God says, who's speaking down there? I can't see. I can't, I can't see you. <laughs> who, is this, who is this ignorant voice that speaks to me out of the darkness? God says, dress for action like a man. I will ask, question you. And you make it known to me. God says, I don't, I don't answer to you. You tell me, smart guy. Verse 4 says, where were you 
when I laid the foundation of the earth. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. God said, man, I wish I had a smart guy like you when I was creating the world. That would have really helped. Where were you, man? I really could have used you. Could have used a smart guy like you. You know, when bad stuff happens in our life, things that we can't explain, I think we think we want God to give us an answer. Trust me, we don't. <laughs> Isaiah 40 says, All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likens compare with him? You know, I've heard people try to discuss the Trinity before in other sermons and other lessons. They try to explain God so that people understand it. They say, you know, God is like a, a three-leaf clover, right? He's one little blade, but it sprouts off into three leaves, but it's one blade, right? Uh, people say, God is like H2O. H2O can manifest itself in different forms. It can be water, right? It can be steam. It can be ice. It can be three things, but it's one. It's one thing, right? Or people say, you know, God is like an egg. There's three parts to an egg, but there's one egg. There's a shell. There's the egg white, and there's the egg yolk. And God says, are you joking? I'm like a clover? I'm like an egg. God says in Isaiah, let's say you're trying to figure me out. All right, let's just say you're trying to figure me out and you take all the people of the entire world. This is what Isaiah says. All the people of the entire world, as multifaceted as they are, different as they are, interesting, unique as they are, he says, compared to me, all the people of the world, compared to me, they're nothing. That means even if you gathered every single person in the entire world together in one group, they still equal zero compared to God. He says, who are you going to compare me to? What, he says, are you going to compare me to? What am I like? God says, you cannot fathom my greatness. There, there is a mystery to God, and that's fine. There is an unknowing to God. That's fine. There's a lot we don't know. So, what can we talk about? We can talk about the things that we do know, right? What do we know? We know there's only one God. There's only one God. Every Hebrew child from an early age memorizes the Shema. They memorize Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. It's recited every morning and every evening for worship. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is the same verse that when questioned, what is the greatest command in Scripture, Jesus says, it's this one. Why have a verse like this? Why have a verse like this in Scripture? Why make this the primary verse that you teach Hebrew children in school? Because it tells you the foundation. There is one God. There is one Lord. Just so there's no confusion well, why would there be confusion? Well, because we're going to get into that. <laughs> we're going to get into that. But let's start from the same point. There is only one God. There is also no other gods, right? If there's only one, then there's no others. Isaiah 43 says, Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. Just in case there was any confusion about the first part, you know, the, the Lord is one, L let's just say also as a side, <laughs> there's no others, right? There is one God. Oh, and by the way, there's no more, right? Just so we're clear, because there is confusion. There is? There is confusion. For instance, in the book, The Encyclopedia of Gods, it lists over 2,500 different gods that have existed in time and throughout the world. God says through the prophet, you say there's other gods besides me? Great. Show me one. God says, I've never seen one. God says, I've never seen another god. 
Turn the page to Isaiah 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God who is like me. Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from old and declared it? And you are my witness. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. God says, you, you, you all say there's other gods. You know, there's other people groups and they worship other gods. Show me. Prove it, God says. Don't just write about it. Don't just talk about it. Don't just carve them out of stone. God says, when I look around, I only see me. Turn the page, Isaiah 45. I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, the people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light, I create darkness, I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Ding dong, yes, hi. Our Bible says that when you die, you can ascend to heaven and you can become a God yourself with your very own planet. God says, eh, wrong answer. No, I am the Lord and there is no other. Another verse, 1 Timothy 6, the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Who else has immortality? God says, just me. Who else has seen all of time, all of existence? God says, just me. Now, in this passage, do I need to understand the part that says, who dwells in unapproachable light? Do I need to know what that means? No. I don't need to know the mysterious and the secret parts. All I need to understand is there is only one God. Acts 17 says the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. In fact, not only is he alone, not only is he the only God, this passage says, if there is anything that is alive right now, it's alive because of God. There is no other force. God says, whatever is born in this world, whatever lives in this world, whatever dies in this world, God alone is in charge of that life. Satan cannot make life. Satan cannot shorten life. Satan cannot take life away. Only God. All of life is in God's hands. This is why God is so adamant that we remove idolatry from our life. This is why God hates idols, that we remove these things that we pursue. The power that we try to amass for ourselves, the, the knowledge that we try to gain, remove all the ways that we worship created stuff, or we try to make ourselves into something that should be worshiped. The scriptures say in 1 John, little children, keep yourself from idols. 1 Corinthians, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. 1 Samuel, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. Listen, idols don't have to be statues. They don't have to be tiki poles. We make our own idols in 2020. We spend our work week, 40 hours, 40 hours of our work week devoted to money, devoted to getting ahead, devoted to making a name for ourselves, devoted to becoming successful. We spend more time with our trucks and our fishing poles and our hobbies and our side businesses we spend more time on social media than we do with God. And he hates it. Rather, we should be praying, God, forgive us, right? God, forgive us. We forget who you are. 
Forgive us. We talk too much and we don't listen. We lead too much and we don't follow. Forgive us that we just assume that we hold our health, that we hold our wellness in our hands. And it's really you. The Lord our God is one. Second, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. In John 8, the scribes and the Pharisees, they get into an argument about who is a true follower of Moses, who is a true follower, who is a true Jew, and who has the authority to speak. And they go back and forth and back and forth with Jesus. And in verse 25, they, they ask him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. And at one point, Jesus talks about Abraham seeing him and his critics fire back and they say, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus says, before Abraham was even born, I am. And in verse 59, the very next verse, it says these Jewish scribes, these teachers of the law, these Pharisees, these people that knew their scriptures picked up stones to throw at him. Why? Because Jesus just said, as plainly as he could, I am God. I am the Father. I am equal. When Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, that was Jesus invoking the name of God, that first name of God that God told Moses from the burning bush. I am is the Hebrew eh ye, eh ye. And it's a name that means both, it means I will be with you, but at the same time it means I am without equal. I am who I am. It's a name, it's a title that nobody but God can claim. And yet Jesus, he puts that name on and he says, this is me. And the Jewish leaders, they pick up stones to try to kill him for blasphemy, but they shouldn't have. They shouldn't have. They should have remembered their Torah classes. They should have remembered the words of the prophecy in Isaiah. A very popular passage that we read at Christmas. Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. You have 47 more days. You're welcome. Very popular passage we read at Christmas time. Prophecy from Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name, whose name, whose name, the baby, right? This baby that's given, this baby's name, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The prophecy says there is a child coming. Isaiah says there is a child coming. A baby is coming for Christmas and he will have a name. What will the name be? The name will be, remember, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to the Jewish people and they recite this passage over and over again. The Lord our God is one, right? The Shema. They, they recite it in the morning and in the evening. They know it. The Lord our God is one. And the prophet says, this baby that is coming, we are going to call this baby Mighty God. And what else? Everlasting Father. How can a new baby be God? How can a new baby be a father? And Jesus says very plainly to them, before Abraham, I am. In John 14, 6, Jesus has a very popular passage that we all know. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But then he says in verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and have seen him. And then watch this. Philip, one of his disciples, verse 8, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Philip says, Jesus, all right, you've done a lot of great things. 
You've taught us a lot of great things, tons of cool stuff, thank you, to be sure, but here's the deal clincher for me. Here, here's what's gonna seal the deal for all of us. If you can just show us God, then that'll be the mic drop and we'll, we'll all be on board. We'll all be on the same team, we'll all believe, there'll be no more doubting. And Jesus says to him in verse nine, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Jesus says, Philip, it's me. Don't, don't you recognize me? You've seen me this whole time. I've been with you this whole time. How do you not recognize me? I'm your dad. Right? That's what he says. Jesus doesn't say, well, actually God and I are very similar. He doesn't say that. He says, I am God. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Right? And then when John the Apostle begins his gospel message, when he starts his book, John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John, here is a man who knew Jesus his entire life. At the end, on the cross, Jesus says to John, take Mary as your mother. Mother, take John as your son. So John lived with Jesus' mom all the rest of her life, which means she would have shared every story with John, every childhood story, uh, the story of Christmas. John would have had all of that knowledge. Nobody, I would argue, nobody knows Jesus better than John. When he is 70 years old and he is writing this down, nobody alive knows Jesus better. In fact, when John writes his own, his own book, he says that he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He uses that phrase many times in his gospel. John says, Jesus, this is how he starts his gospel. He says, Jesus and God are the same. The same. And many other passages of scripture agree. Speaking of Jesus in Colossians 2, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. How much of God is in Jesus? Colossians says all of it. The fullness of God. Hebrews 1, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This passage says, how identical is Jesus with God? He is the exact imprint. He is the exact imprint. In fact, who holds the universe in their hand? This passage says Jesus, right? Jesus. Philippians 2, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What's the significance here? Well, if hero Israel, the Lord is one and there's only one God, then I can only worship one God. It would be blasphemy to worship something else. I can only worship the one God. Philippians says that one day everyone will bow and worship Jesus. He is to be worshiped. Not just as a loving, lift my hands up in a worship service way, but also in a fall down on your face and worship him, I am God way. Look at John 5. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Wow. You think about all those faiths, all those 
divergence of Christianity that place Jesus below God, that say that he's not equal, that he's not the same. This passage says, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Meaning if you have the wrong idea about Jesus in your head, then you have the wrong idea about God in your head. And what else does it say? Because I think, I think if you read this passage through, it destroys all the pictures of God that you have in your brain. Right? I think this is such a powerful verse. You, you have a couple of pictures of God in your head, and they're both wrong. You have this picture of God as being a strong, powerful, and mighty man who has visible muscles. He has a deep, booming voice. He has a long beard. He is judge. He is father. He is the disciplinarian, right? And then you have a picture of Jesus, and he's our friend. He's our buddy. Jesus cried. He bled. He felt emotions. He had friends. And we paint pictures of Jesus as being this frail, thin, meek, weak person. A lot of very skinny, emaciated actors have played Jesus. Jesus hugs kids. Jesus talks to women. He's tender. Jesus died. Jesus loves me. And we have this picture in our head. We think that we love Jesus and we're scared of his dad. Wrong. Both of those pictures are wrong. God and Jesus are the same being. In fact, <clears throat> in fact, look at John 5. It says that it is Jesus who judges you in the end, not the Father. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. In fact, we have it even more wrong. We have it even more wrong. John 3, 16. We all know that verse. We all love to say it. We all love to recite it. What does it say? God loved the world so much that he gave. The Bible says that it's the Father who loves you, and it's the Son who judges you. You've had it backwards. The judge was not in the sky watching Calvary. It was the judge who died on the cross. Jesus is to be honored and loved and prayed to equally to the Father, this passage in John says. They are one in the same. God is not an egg. God is not water. God is not a clover. He is to be honored. He is to be worshiped. Last, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. As humans, we are meaning makers. We are answer finders, right? So we, we, when we think about God, we tend to think about God being along a vertical timeline, right? Because the Bible is a vertical timeline. And so this is how we picture it. God made the universe, and then he hung out for a bit until the book of Matthew. And then Jesus, Jesus appears, it's Christmas time, and then it's his turn for a little while, and then he goes away, and then it's the Holy Spirit's turn. The Holy Spirit is born at the birth of the church. That's when we first see the Holy Spirit, at the birth of the church. This is also wrong. Genesis 1, first page of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Who was there at creation? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was there at creation. In fact, if you go back to John 1, 3 that we looked at earlier, remember, this is, we're, we're doing Bible study, right? We're doing Bible study. John writes, all things were made through him. Who? Jesus. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. So who was there at creation? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Genesis 126, a little further down the page, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Whose image? Our image. When the Hebrew people read the scriptures, 
and they read the name Elohim. That is a name that ends in plural. That name has a plural ending. The Hebrew people have always worshipped one God, and yet, from the very first page, God is multiple, God is plural, God is many, God is three, God is one. God has a very strange existence, and it's beyond us. It's a mystery. The Bible says there's one God. That's the groundwork. That's the, that's the base. That's where we start. God is one. And then it goes on to tell you, oh yeah, but Jesus is also God. Oh yeah, but the Holy Spirit is also God. And the Bible says that when you believe that, when you believe that that God, that three-in-one God, that triune God came to know you, that when he came to love you, that he came to die for you on a cross, that your judge took your place on that cross, that he died for your sins, when you receive that knowledge and when you believe that that is true, then the Spirit of God, who craves intimacy with you, enters into your life and that that God's Spirit then talks to your spirit and God dwells in you and he tabernacles with you. And once the Spirit enters you, this body becomes a living temple. Your body becomes a living, breathing temple. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So, glorify God in your body. Right now, we are not in a church. You are a church. Right now, we are not in a temple. You are a temple. A Christian is a living temple where God lives. It's sometimes unfathomable. It's often inconceivable. We work our whole life trying to figure this out. But church is not school. Even though we model early churches after institutions of higher learning, we place the pastor in professor's robes and we give him a podium and we stick him in front of a screen or a chalkboard and then we stick all the students out there in, in little wooden rows. But the point of this room is not to understand God. It's not even to learn about God. The reason why we gather here today is to worship God. The unknown parts can be mysterious. Th those parts can remain a mystery. We don't need to know it all. In fact, what's your, what's your favorite part? Tell me, what's your favorite part about church? The answer is worship. Because it's all worship. All of it. All of it is worship. The songs are just as important as the sermon. The offering is just as important as the songs. It's all worship. 1 Corinthians 6 says, what are you going to do this week? What will you do this week? Glorify God with your body. What are you going to say this week? What are the words that are going to come out of your mouth? Glorify God with your mouth. What are you going to think about this week? Glorify God with your mind. Why should I? Why? I got things to do. Because you are not your own and you were bought with a price. Bought by God with the blood of the Son. Bought by God with the love from the Father and His Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit lives in you. You are not your own. So glorify God with your life. Let's pray. Father God, I would just start by asking for forgiveness that we don't always think about you correctly. We try to define you and label you and put you in a box 
And yet time and time again, you say, there's just no way. There's no way we could understand you. There's no way we can label you or classify you. And the mysterious parts of you can remain mysterious. And I should be fine with that. I do not need to know. In my attempts to find answers and to know and to seek knowledge, Lord, I should replace all that effort with worship. I should replace all that effort with obedience. And my life should be about worshiping you. My life should be about following you. Lord Jesus, forgive me for trying to label you and classify you whenever I paint a picture of you as weak and frail, whenever I paint a picture of you that is not worthy of your greatness because you and the Father are equal. Lord, we just ask that more of us would come to a better understanding of who you are and your role in our life, that you are the Savior of all, that you came and that you died and that you gave your life. Holy Spirit, we ask for your forgiveness as we try to lessen you and make you out to be some sort of spirit figure or ghost. And yet you are equal with God. You live in us. You speak to our spirit. You are the part of us that makes us holy. You are the part of us that makes us a temple. And Lord, as we consider what it means to be a Christian, as we consider our role alongside the Trinity, I would just ask that you would take away any desire in us that we would try to understand, that we would admit the mysterious, admit the secrecy, and be fine with it, and that we wouldn't spend our lives trying to figure you out. We would use all that time, use all that energy, and replace it with worship, replace it with obedience, because there is nothing more important. And as we go from this place, may we remember that we are still your living temple. We are your living church because you live in us. Take us away from our own pursuits and our own idols, those things that we create falsely every day, those things that we think deserve our time and our attention, they don't. We do this because we were bought with a price, an extravagant price. And we should never forget the blood that was given or the love that was shown. And we ask all of this in your son's precious name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in, for watching, uh, for viewing this service. Of course, we are on YouTube. There is a URL, there's an address up there at the top. You're more than welcome to copy that, post this video to your own social media wall so that other people can see uh, what you experienced, what you learned this Sunday morning, or you can post it to a friend's wall if you think they might benefit from these lessons today. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.